yeah, yeah. Moses was having a conversation with God in the burning bush. God was sending him to, to Egypt, and we spent the whole of last week talking about all the excuses Moses had of why he couldn't do what God was asking him to do. And God basically showed him through his conversation that the answer to all of those excuses was God's presence. I will be with you. Uh, he said, I can't speak good. I will be with your mouth, you know, over and over again. And finally, at the last excuse, Moses basically just said, hey, God, send somebody else. You know, I just don't want to go. And then we saw it say it said God got angry. God was angry with Moses. But in his anger, we saw that it was a very strange response. He said in his anger, he said, OK, I'm going to send Aaron with you. And Aaron's going to be your mouthpiece. And Aaron's going to speak to the people of Israel and do the signs uh, in front of the people of Israel. You'll speak to him. He'll speak to the people of Israel. Uh, he will be uh, your mouthpiece. And at the end, he said, Aaron is coming to meet you. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to pick up as in verse 18 of chapter 4, where Moses is preparing to leave to go back to Egypt. And there are, there are issues all through this text that we're going to have to talk about uh, and their questions that are going to need to be answered. So in verse 18, he's just finished this conversation. He's going to go now. God said, I'm going to send Aaron with you. And verse 18 says, Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. So first question, why? Why does he go back to Jethro and ask for permission to leave? Because, yeah, I mean, technically he is an employee. He's also a son-in-law, but we saw that he was the shepherd of Jethro's flock. He didn't have his own flock or anything like that. He was a hired hand. Probably he is the son-in-law. I mean, he is the son-in-law, but probably he desired to leave on good terms, get the family's blessing. We're going to see in a moment he's taking his family with him. He's taking Zipporah, his wife, and his two sons with him. So he wanted a happy departure, not just to run off with them. But here's the next question that I don't have an answer for. Why does Moses, I mean, Moses basically, is Moses telling the truth to Jethro about why he's leaving? What does he say? He says whether they're still alive. Why does, he, why does he say this? Why didn't he tell him the whole truth of what happened and why he's going back to, to Israel, or to Egypt? And it, He's still hoping he can wiggle out of it? That, it may be. I don't have a good answer. I mean, I've got a couple answers of what people say, but nobody knows for sure. He thought maybe the guy would think he was nuts. It, that's a good answer, too. The guy might think he was nuts. You know, can you imagine? Uh, excuse me, uh, Jethro, Dad, uh, the burning bush told me to go back to Egypt. <laughs> so, see ya, you know. Maybe he thought that, you know. Maybe he was... Still not sure that he believed all this himself? We, 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 we just don't know. We just don't know. But regardless of what was in his heart, which we can't see from the text because we're not told, um, Moses is being obedient uh, at this point. You know, after all of his excuses, he, he is going. He has decided to go and he's, he's packing up. And then in verse 9... It's strange because it kind of breaks the narrative. It says, And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons, plural, and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Several things here. Why does God tell him, Go back to Egypt because all the men who are seeking your life are dead. I mean, God already told him, you're going to succeed. He already told him, I'm going to be with you. He already told him, you're going to deliver my people. Why tell him now, go on back to Egypt because all the people that were seeking your life are dead? Why would he say that? That's true. She said Moses had been excuse after excuse after excuse. Maybe God is giving him a little assurance that, you know, he's not a fugitive anymore. When he left Egypt, he was a fugitive. They were seeking him because he'd murdered an Egyptian. Pharaoh was out to kill him. And now maybe God's given him, maybe given him a little assurance. Huh? God's grease in the wheel. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, he's, he's, showing, he's showing Moses 
in a sense, the exodus that, that God has foretold is coming through Moses really kind of has already started because those people that were seeking him are dead now. They're dying off. Pharaoh is dead and all the people that were seeking after Moses are, are dead. Maybe he's assuring Moses who is afraid of his past. You know, the last time he was there, they were all hunting him, you know. So all of this, all of this could be true. We're just not told. There, there's so many things in this text that we just, we just don't know. But you got to admit that this would be an assurance to Moses, don't you think? That, okay, you know, God has promised that should have been enough. You should have faith that God's word says what God's word says, and there you go. But God in his grace is giving Moses a little assurance. They're not going to be seeking your life when you come back there. All the people that thought were hunting you are dead. And so Moses loads his family up. Notice it says his sons. Do you remember his sons' names? You weren't given both of them. You've only, you only have been told so far one of his sons' names. You remember that one son's name? Gershom. Way to go. We're not told his other son's name until chapter 18, Eleazar. But he puts his sons and his wife on this donkey. And this shows us that Moses is not just, Moses is not just personally returning to Egypt to be the deliverer and then come on back home. He is relocating his family so that he and his family will come out of Egypt with Israel. They are uh, identifying themselves with the people of Israel. They are, they are going to be Israelites, part of the covenant of God. They're going to be there in Egypt, and they're going to come out of Egypt with Israel. Again, you see Moses now identifying himself with his people. Did you also notice that, uh, that, that shepherd's staff has got a new name now? See it up there? What is it now? Yeah, no longer a shepherd's staff. Now it's the staff of God. So it's set apart for God's use. And we talked about the staff last time as God told him, hey, Moses, remember to take your staff, you know, and you're going to use the staff to do some signs in front of Israel and in front of Pharaoh. The staff is now a symbol and an instrument of God's power. And Moses is going to use that staff to do several of the plagues, to part the Red Sea, to do all of those things. Actually, God is doing them through Moses, but he's going to use this God takes this ordinary instrument of, 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 a, of a lowly shepherd and uses it for his glory. And then at this point, this is where we're, this in the next section is where we're going to spend most of our time tonight because this is where all the questions come in. This point, God is going to reveal the rest of his plan to Moses. Now, remember what he told him at the burning bush. We talked about it last time. Uh, he told him what to say. He told him what signs to do. But who were the signs for when we, when we were talking about them at the burning bush? They were for Israel. Yeah, These, this is what you shall say to Israel. These are the signs, the putting your hand in and pulling it out, and it's leprous, and the, the staff turning into a snake and back into a staff, the pouring out of some of the Nile water that turns to blood. He said, these are the signs you're going to do so Israel will know that I have sent you. Now he tells him, listen, not only are you going to go to speak to, uh, to Israel, but you're going to go right into the presence of Pharaoh himself. Verse 21, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So he tells him, he's told him these miracles to do for Israel so that they would believe. Now he's telling him, this is what's going to happen. You're going to be face to face in engaging in spiritual battle with the enemy himself. You're going to be right in front of Pharaoh and you're going to do the same signs that convinced Israel. You're going to do those signs before Pharaoh, but they're not going to convince Pharaoh. God says he is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. Now there is a huge debate about that little statement. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart. What do you think the issue is? Yes.
Yeah, by the end, yes. The, Yes, but including once Pharaoh's firstborn son is killed, then Pharaoh agrees, but then he changes his mind again. Yes? Free will. Yeah, isn't that the issue? Is Pharaoh able to respond to the message that, that God has given? It says here clearly that, and we're going to see this, in several different ways over the course of the entire Exodus. God is already telling, already telling Moses, he's saying, you're going to do these miracles before Pharaoh. And it's not just God predicting Pharaoh's not going to listen to you. God says, I will harden, he's, he's making a, a statement here, I will harden his heart so that, in order that, he will not let the people go. Now, Many people see a moral problem here about whether God is sovereign or man is responsible for the choices that he makes. Whether, whether God is sovereign over all things and how it works with man being responsible for what he does and he doesn't do. So many see it as a moral problem, but the real issue is that it is not a moral problem. The Bible uses, through the Exodus, three different ways to describe this situation. And they're used side by side, over and over again. Sometimes, throughout this whole narrative of the Exodus uh, plagues and all of that, sometimes it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Sometimes it says Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And sometimes it just says... Pharaoh's heart was hardened without any, without any um, uh, you know, implication of who is doing the hardening. So the reality that I want you to see, and I find myself pushing back against both sides whenever this discussion comes up, is Philip Ryken has this quote, and I thought, it was, I thought it was germane to the kind of stance that I take on this issue, uh, biblical stance, I believe, when, when, whenever it comes up. And he says this, he, so my Pharaoh, he hardened his own heart. Nevertheless, God hardened his heart for him. Both of these statements are true. And there's no contradiction between them. Pharaoh's will was also God's will. God not only knew that Pharaoh would refuse to let his people go, but he actually ordained it. This is the paradox of divine sovereignty and human responsibility, which is not a puzzle to be solved but a mystery to be adored. If you've ever had this conversation with me before, uh, you'll hear me say that many times. In fact, if you're on the search committee, we had, uh, we had this conversation as they, were, as they were interviewing me. Both of these things are true. God is absolutely sovereign in all things, in every way, and man has a real choice and is responsible for his choice. Both of those things are true. And whenever someone, you know, I've had several since I've moved here on one side or the other, they try to, they try to uh, push uh, one way or the other. I always find myself pushing back on both sides, you know. So the one leaves thinking I believe something and the other believes thinking I believe something else. So, for instance, let me give you an example. Just so, so somebody comes up, we've had people come here uh, that would say, you know, well, I just believe, I believe God's sovereign, and that means that, you know, whatever happens is, um, is fatalistically determined, and we have no say, we have no choice, we, we just, you know, that's wrong, that's not true, that's not true, and I'm not gonna, I, I push back against it. And then I have another side of people that come and they say, well, you know, God just, God just lets us do whatever we want to do. And he just, you know, he's just up there going, man, I wonder, you know, I know what they're going to do, but man, I wish they did. No, that's not true either. God's in control. So the problem is when people discuss these two things, God's sovereignty and human responsibility, what they want is a philosophical way to mesh these two things and explain them when the Bible doesn't give us that. It says both are true and we hold both of those things as true. Yes, God is absolutely sovereign in all things and yes, you have a real choice and you are responsible before God for the choice that you make. 
Questions, comments, cries of outrage. None. Oh, Don. Yes, yes. Okay, everybody hear that? Okay, he said he, he compared his heart to a towel, which God rang out. If you wring out a towel, the towel gets hard and the water runs out. God wrung his heart to reveal what was in Pharaoh's heart. Um, there are, there's an aspect of that that I can agree with. Um, but it, it, also has to, it also has to be remembered that if... He will not. Yeah. Okay. That's it. It says you can't you can't get away from the text. God says, I will harden his heart. And there's a reason that I'm going to harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Now, where people fall off in the wrong ditch is what they what they think that means is Pharaoh's just this great guy. He's just this nice guy. And God comes up behind him with put a gun to his head and says, you're not going to you're not going to let him go. That's not what happened. Pharaoh was doing what Pharaoh wanted to do. He was doing what his sinful heart desires. And it was God's will that he was doing what he would do. Everybody understand that? I'm going to always, I'm going to always push back on both sides because both things are true. And we don't have to explain how they work together. The Bible doesn't tell us that. So I'm very hesitant to go into some philosophical explanation about how God's sovereignty and man's responsibility work together because we're not told that in Scripture. Yes? Why wouldn't he have stopped it in his heart? <laughs> Good question. I'm going to answer that question right now. So God did this for a purpose. There's a tension between the, in the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. So we're told throughout the Exodus that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart comes from two sources. It comes from God. Many times it says God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. But it also says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. So this hardening is coming from two sources and there's no contradiction between that. Um, we can't say that um, God just knew what he was going to do and is foretelling it because he's saying, I'm going to do this. And he did it, to answer your question, Jerry, for a purpose. In Exodus chapter 10, verse uh, 1 and 2, it says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants. And this is the reason why that I might show these signs of mine among them and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them. And this is the reason that you may know that I am the Lord. The reason he did it is to glorify himself. To glorify himself before his people. Also in Exodus 14, 4, he says, and I, this is God speaking, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will pursue them when they're letting them out of Egypt. And this is why. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his hosts and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. So Israel will know that I'm the Lord and I'll get glory and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and I get glory. But in the same vein, you can't take that and make it the whole of your theology and say, well, Pharaoh didn't have a choice. He was just a robot. You know, God put a gun to it. You can't say that as well because Pharaoh was responsible for the choices that he made. In Exodus chapter 8, verse 31, 32, it says, And the Lord did as Moses asked and removed the swarms of flies from Pharaoh, from his servants and from his people. Not one remained. Look, but Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. He is responsible for his sin. He's responsible for the choice he made. He is not an automaton. He's not a robot. He's not, he's not being programmed by God. Pharaoh is doing what his sinful heart desires to do, and that is also part of the will of God in glorifying himself. Everybody with me? Questions, comments? We kind of talked about this when we went through the Baptist faith and message and talked about election and grace and all those things. These are two sides of the same coin, 
and they're both true, and I don't have to give you a philosophical explanation of how it works together because the Bible doesn't do that. Okay? With me? Nobody's throwing tomatoes yet? All right. Just remember, God is sovereign over all things. And man is responsible for the choices that he makes. Yes? Well, Pharaoh did this Pharaoh's entire life, the Israelites had been his slaves. Yes. That's a good point. It may, that, that might be true. He said, he said they have been slaves of Pharaoh all of this time, so the hardening of his heart could have been over the course of his whole lifetime, you know, that he has been hardened over the course of his lifetime. And, but also, and that's true, and the hardening of his heart is said to be something that just happens, says, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened many times, but it's also something that God says, I'm doing, I will harden his heart. And it's also something that Pharaoh is doing. Pharaoh is hardening his heart. So you can't separate these things. I think I, some people take this to mean that on the one hand, okay, God hardened it over here, and then later Pharaoh hardened it, and then later God hardened it again. Then I think this is all speaking about the same thing, the hardening of his heart. God's will, Pharaoh's will, and the circumstances themselves, the plagues harden his heart. Okay? All right. Yes, Richard, you have a question? Didn't we lose our total free will? Lose our, what do you mean by that? So, in the sense that we are able to do what is pleasing to God, uh, well, Adam and Eve were the only ones who were created perfectly with no sin nature, with, able to please God with their actions, by their own actions. And that was marred in the fall so that we are, as people, are unable to please God in any, any way, shape, or form, even with good works, even with any of those things. So if you're asking if, you're asking if we... Depends on how you mean free will. Okay, so here's the thing. You have real choices. You have real opportunity to choose this, that, or the other thing. Um, but the Bible says that unless the Holy Spirit draws you, no man will come to him. So in the sense that we are able to, just by our own initiative and our own drive, uh, come and love God, then no, that's a work of the Holy Spirit inside of us. And it comes by the gospel. But there is also a real choice and a real decision to trust in Jesus. So when people talk about regeneration and they talk about salvation, whether it's God's sovereignty and election or whether it's God or whether it's man's just free will choice, I always push back on both sides and say it is God's sovereign election, just like just like Ephesians 1 says, but it's also a real choice that you make when you trust in Jesus. So I I don't I don't I find myself pushing back on both sides. And to be honest, the question, when I say that, I can, I mean, I can't hear your thoughts, but I can hear your thoughts. Your, your, your question is, how can that be? How does that work together? And my answer is, I don't know, and I don't have to tell you. The Bible doesn't tell me. It says that God is sovereign. Ephesians chapter 1 says he, um, he, he uh, predestined us before the foundation of the world, and Man has a real responsibility and a choice to trust in Jesus and be saved. Both of those things are true, and I'm going to hold to both of those things together, um, unless, uh, always, because there's not going to be any new Bible written. <laughs> okay? Yes, Evan, make it an easy one, please. <laughs> so, I, I've been, I've been, you can ask your question if you want to. I've been in... I've, I've, I've tried to, people have tried to corner me in one shoehorn or another, and I've always, always tried to be faithful to what Scripture says without, without confusing the issue and without speaking where the Scripture doesn't speak. So I can't, I can't say to you that God's up there going, man... Well, I just wish they'd do, you know, because why, why do we pray for lost loved ones? God's up there going, 
Well, hey, I did all I had to do. Now, you need to go convince them. Don't pray to me about it. And that's not how it works. God draws people to Himself. God sends the Holy Spirit to convict hearts. God regenerates people by His power, His power alone. But also, it's not a robotic thing. There's warnings all through Scripture. There's admonitions all through Scripture. You have to trust in Jesus. You have to have faith in Christ. You have to choose to repent of your sin. and tr- Those two things are both true. I think the best explanation that I've ever heard, I don't remember if it was Spurgeon or if it was Criswell who said this, but he said, when a person walks up to the door of salvation, on the front of that door, it says, whosoever will, let him come. And you have a real choice whether you open that door of salvation or not. And when you you open that door and you say, I choose to trust Jesus, and you walk through that door, on the back of that door it said, I chose you before the foundation of the world. That's the best best explanation that that I've ever heard. So if you want more than that, I don't have more for you. Now understand, there's a lot of people that are going to disagree with me on both sides. So... That's just a fact. It's just a fact. Is that it? Okay. <laughs> That's not the hardest part of this text. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Okay, here we go. I'll be happy to talk more about any of that with y'all if you want to. I'm not, I'm not afraid to talk about it at all. So he says, Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, Let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. Sounds like he's giving Pharaoh a choice, doesn't it? So he tells Moses to warn him. And this is a foreshadow of the 10th plague, isn't it? The killing of the firstborn son of all of Egypt. The firstborn son is the favored one, the one that receives the inheritance, the one that represents the family. For Pharaoh, the firstborn son would be the one who takes the throne when he dies. Pharaoh is holding God's son captive. That's what he says. Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go. Exodus is about a loving father rescuing his children to be a family together, to worship him, to serve him. God is calling Israel, his son, out of Egypt. And all of this points to the gospel. In Hosea chapter 1, uh, it's quoted. It says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. That same phrase in Hosea chapter 11 verse 1 is quoted in Matthew chapter 2 about Jesus. It says, He rose and took the child. Joseph rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill the, what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Hosea is the one he's talking about. Out of Egypt I called my son. Showing that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. The true Israel. But notice in this text, it's not just for freedom's sake that he is freeing them. It says, let my son go that he may serve me. Some of your translations may say, worship me. It says, free them so they will be free to worship and serve me. They don't belong to you, Pharaoh. They're mine. Release them so that they will serve their true Lord and Master. And he's told to warn Pharaoh, if you don't, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. God's going to demonstrate his power over the throne of Egypt. Basically, he says, release my son or I'm going to take yours. And now we come to the most debated text probably in Exodus. There's questions about every part of this text. So let me read the whole section, verses 24 through 26, and then we'll go back and explain all the issues, and maybe you can tell me what it means. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now, I'm going to give you the majority interpretation and then I'm going to tell you why, what my opinion is. We all have opinions, that's all we have, because this is never, this, something like this is never repeated anywhere in the Bible. We don't see any, I mean we see circumcision, but we don't see the touching of the feet and what bridegroom of blood means. That's the only place it's here is in scripture, in here, right here. So here's the majority interpretation, what most scholars, interpreters, pastors say. It says basically that Moses didn't circumcise his son 
And so God strikes Moses on the way to Egypt and is going to kill Moses. But his wife, Zipporah, acts quickly to circumcise the son, touches his foreskin to Moses' feet. God heals Moses, and then they're back on their way because he circumcised the son. And the application usually of that is, if you're going to obey, you better obey all the way. Um, that's the majority interpretation, and to be honest, it very well could be right. It very, there's a lot I don't know. Um, but look at your Bibles if you have them. In verse 25, is there a footnote by the word Moses in your Bible? What does the footnote read? No, no, not bridegroom of blood. Moses in verse 25. Foreskin and touched Moses' feet. What does it say? Somebody say it louder. I can't hear you. His. Moses' name does not appear in this text anywhere. That is a translator's interpretation. And it's in the ESV. It says, Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched his feet with it. So here's, what, here's where the questions come in. Uh, Moses is not really mentioned anywhere. It just says him. And the lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death and him and his and all those things. But because it says a bridegroom of blood, which all of your Bibles say the translation of this phrase is uncertain, most interpreters and most translators think it has to be Moses because he's, he's the only bridegroom, you know. But this raises some questions. Moses is God's spokesman. He's God's prophet. God called Moses forth to go to Egypt. He told him what all is going to happen in Egypt. And now, because his son is not circumcised, he's going to put Moses to death. Uh, Moses angered God before at the burning bush, you remember? And God didn't put him to death. God said, basically, okay, I'm going to send Aaron with you. Why does he want to kill Moses now? In fact... Um, if you look back, I'm going to go quickly because I've spent way too much time on the other, the Pharaoh's heart question. But if you look back at the actual law of circumcision, it's not dad who gets punished. It says, this is the law. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. He's talking to Abraham. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generation, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Now look at this. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So the actual punishment was not on dad for not circumcising his son. It was on the one who is uncircumcised. So that's a question. Why did he want to kill Moses, do you think? I, I don't think... I don't think he did. I think he wanted to kill the firstborn son of Moses because he just talked about the killing of the firstborn and now Moses has a son that he hasn't circumcised for sure. We know that. And he is not in the covenant people. And so I think it's Gershom, but I could be wrong. That's an opinion. I have, the text doesn't tell us. All it says is, at a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took out a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched his feet with it and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Why does the wife touch his feet with it? Whether we're talking about Moses' feet or Gershom's feet, whichever one, why does she touch? How does touching Moses' feet or Gershom's feet put them in blood covenant together? Yeah. You want to hear my answer? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> this, is never, this is never done anywhere else in Scripture, so I honestly, I honestly don't know. So there are some others, it's not the majority opinion, but there are some others that think it was Gershom who God sought to kill, not Moses. Remember, Moses' name is not mentioned in the, in the Hebrew text. It's put there by the English translators. Um, 
and he sought to kill him because Moses obviously didn't circumcise his son as God had commanded to be Israel. And he just finished saying Israel is his firstborn son and those are his covenant people. If you don't let them go, Pharaoh, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. And now the very next text, he's seeking to kill somebody. I think it's the firstborn son. Now Moses is on the way, and his son has not been circumcised. He is not part of the covenant people. And we're not told why he wasn't circumcised, so we don't know that either. We don't know. There's a lot of people who, who think, and, and it sounds plausible, that maybe Zipporah, who was a Midianite, didn't want her son circumcised, and that's why she's the one that jumps in and, and does it to save his life. We just don't know. The text doesn't say any of that. So the, all of that is just guessing. It's just supposition. But God sought to kill him, whoever him is, whether it's Moses or his son, because Moses had not put the sign of the covenant upon him. Um, and seeing this is happening, that her, I believe it's her firstborn son that is dying, or it could be Moses, it very well could be, she jumps in and she circumcises her son and she touches the foreskin to his feet, and then she says, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. Now, as many of your texts have already said, when you looked at your footnote, there's a translation issue about what it means, bridegroom of blood. It's not used anywhere else in Scripture. Um, the, there are some who say, and this is true, I think, that this is a Hebrew phrase used to mean anyone who Anyone who is related not by birth, but by covenant relationship, whether marriage or son-in-law, brother-in-law. And just to prove to you that I'm not just making stuff up, I brought a quote from Dwayne Garrett, who's a commentator on Exodus. And this is what he said. It says, the word chatan, which is bridegroom here, translated bridegroom, it only means bridegroom in the context of a wedding ceremony. And he gives verses listed where it's used that way. A married woman with children would not call her husband the father of her children, chatan. After marriage, as a term for a family member, the word chatan means son-in-law, and he gives the, the references. Had Zipporah called Moses her chatan, she would have been calling him her son-in-law. In addition, since the Hebrew chatan can mean son-in-law, the term as used here, he's talking about this passage, may refer to making someone become a relative by a covenantal bond. If so, then chatan may describe bringing someone into the community by the ritual of circumcision. Dwayne Garrett says this. So that makes a lot of sense to me. What I think, and listen, I can't prove any of this. This is, no, nobody knows. We all just have opinions. What I think is happening is, what's at issue is not Moses' life. It's Moses' firstborn son. For whatever reason, they did not circumcise him. She acts to save his life. She circumcises him, and she puts the bloody foreskin on his feet, not Moses' feet, but his feet, to bring him into the covenant by blood. Now, now it's not just her son, they're related by covenant. And that's why she says, a bridegroom of blood. And that's why the, the writer, of, uh, the writer Moses, who, who wrote this, said, it was then that she said, a bridegroom or a covenant relation of blood because of the circumcision. Now, that's not a majority opinion. This is a really strange text. So let me say this. Either way that we take it, whether it's Moses who is dying and whose feet are touched with the circumcision, or whether it's the firstborn son Gershom who is dying, whose feet are touched, the application of this is the exact same. We have to read it in the context of the Exodus. God has just foretold the 10th plague of the Exodus. He's just foretold, you're going to let my son go or I'm going to kill your firstborn son, Pharaoh. He's just said, basically foreshadowing the Passover where the angel of death passes over. And the angel of death passes over and kills all the firstborn in Egypt except who? The ones who have the blood of the covenant on the door. So those who have the blood applied. Here, a life was saved. Whether you think it was Moses or Gershom, we honestly just don't know. But either way, 
A life was saved by the covenant of blood. A substitute of blood was given for the life of either Moses or his son. A sacrifice of blood brings him into the covenant people and it says God let him alone and they continued on their journey. It's a picture of the coming Passover and it's a picture of the new covenant in Jesus. The only thing that turns aside the wrath of God. Moses is God's man. Moses is God's you know, deliverer, his savior. And these are Moses' children that are going to be part of, of Israel coming out of Egypt and all of those things. But the only thing that turns aside the wrath of God is the blood of the covenant. And we see that same truth in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. The blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that turns away the wrath of God. Doesn't matter how, you know, Zipporah could have got down on her knees and prayed. She could have been sincere. She could have said, God, I'm so sorry. And she could have done all kinds of things to show her sincerity and to show her her willingness to follow or whatever, her devotion to God. It wouldn't have mattered because the only thing that turns away the wrath of God is the blood of the covenant. And in this case, the covenant sign was circumcision. She knew that. She jumps into action. And by the blood of the covenant, a life was saved. Whether you think it was Moses' or the firstborn son, it doesn't matter. Questions? Yes? Why did they go ahead and circumcise the second son also? Yeah. Um, he asked why they didn't go ahead and circumcise the other one, the other son too, because they're two sons. There are some that think that it was the, the younger son who wasn't yet circumcised. I don't buy that, but I don't know. I don't know. I think, Lyle, it has to do with, with the fact that Gershom was the firstborn son. And we just got through talking about the firstborn son is going to die. The, the firstborn son is going to be part of the, the ones who are killed in the 10th plague of Egypt. Um, and so, yeah, that, I, I can't give you a definitive answer. I don't know. I don't know. Yes? In the previous passage, it said the responsibility of the son is to be circumcised. The responsibility is not on the father. Why are you focusing on the son, not the father? Well, I don't think that he asked why in the previous passage, the Genesis passage where God is speaking to Abraham, talking about circumcision, uh, he said that... Uh, the, the responsibility was on the son, not on the father. Why do you think that's so? I don't think the responsibility to circumcise uh, the son is on the son, but I think by not circumcising him, the punishment was that the son is cut off from the people. So it's, it's, not, that, it's not that the eight-day ba old baby has to circumcise himself or you're in trouble. It's that if the parents do not circumcise their son on the eighth day, what they're doing is condemning their son to be outside of the co covenant community. Yes, which in itself would be a punishment for the parents. Yeah, yeah. The rest of the text is very anticlimactic. It says... <laughs> yeah, after that, whoo. It says, the Lord said to Aaron, so at, life is saved, the son is circumcised, everything's going back to normal. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness and meet Moses. Aaron is in Egypt. We talked about this a little last week. Aaron is in Egypt. Moses is in Midian. They're going to meet together at the mountain of God, which is Sinai. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. So Moses basically tells Aaron everything that happened and everything we've seen. And it says, Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. So now we fast forward and they're in Egypt now. And it says, they got, gathered all the elders of the people of Egypt. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord has spoken to Moses and did the signs that the, in the sight of the people. Why does Aaron do that? Why is Aaron speaking and doing the signs? That's what God said. Moses is whining about how he can't speak. So Aaron, God said, okay, I'm going to send Aaron, and he's going to speak to the people of Israel. He's going to do the signs that, that we've given to the people of Israel. And this might have been a blessing in disguise, too, because, you know, Moses, who are you? You've been gone 40 years, we don't, you know, but Aaron has been there. Maybe he was kind of his Barnabas to Moses' and Saul. Who knows? We don't know that for sure. And finally, it says the people believed. 
Isn't that exactly what God said would happen? The people believed, and when they heard that the Lord, look at this, had visited the people of Israel. What does that mean when he uses that phrase, that the Lord visited his people? Whenever you see that, you're going to see it all through the Psalms when it talks about the Exodus, when it talks about whenever you see the Lord visiting his people, even in Judges, what it means is God is coming to help. God is coming to deliver. God is acting to deliver his people or to free his people or to aid his people or to help his people. It, when you see God visited them, that is a term that means God is now coming to act. And he said, God visited Israel and he saw their affliction and they bowed their heads and they worshiped. That's a big difference in reaction than the first time Moses tried to save the people, isn't it? What was different? What's different now that wasn't the case 40 years ago when he tried? God's with him now. God is with him now. Aaron is his mouthpiece. God has given him a word to speak to the people. God has shown in the signs that God is with him. And God is now ready to deliver the people through Moses. Before it was just Moses acting on his own, in his own strength, his own power. Now it is the weak and feeble, I can't do this Moses, that God is going to use in his power and glory to glorify his name. And he does the same with us today. God's timing is always perfect. Timing is always perfect. Ain't that the truth? Even if we don't like it. Questions, comments before we go? I am glad we're done with that text. Good job. Not my fave. Not my fave. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you that, that, that even when there are questions we can't answer because the text doesn't provide that information, we know that if the text doesn't provide it, it's not something we need to know to apply it to ourselves. So God, we thank you for the application of the text, showing us that it is only the blood of the covenant that turns away wrath. God, we thank you for the application of the text that shows us that you are in control and that we are responsible for our choices. God, we thank you for the application of the text that shows us, God, that it is only when you are with us that your plans succeed and that your strength becomes our strength because we are weak. God, we thank you for the application of the text, even if all of our little bitty questions aren't answered. We know that what is there is what you intended to be there, and it's all we need. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this church, God, and I pray that you would bless us as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen.